Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, August 2nd, we are studying Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 through chapter 4, verse 6. In today's text, Malachi preaches concerning the coming day of the Lord. On that day, the Lord will come with blazing condemnation for the arrogant and the evildoers, even as he causes the Son of Righteousness to rise with healing in its wings for those who have feared the Lord. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Doug Gribbenaw. Pastor Gribbenaw serves as Mission Advocate for KFUO Radio in St. Louis, Missouri. Pastor Gribbenaw, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Hey, it's great to be back with all of you. Thanks for having me by again. And you also do the afternoon music program, correct, Pastor Gribbenaw? That's right. In, in addition to uh, helping to connect our recognized service organizations, our parishes, congregations, and, and other entities in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, with KFUO, because we're all working together, right? Um, I do have the pleasure of hosting uh, what I call the afternoon music block from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Central Time on KFUO. And uh, my my knowledge of and uh, an experience with our hymnal has, has grown so much. I've been doing it for about two and a half years, and it's really, it's the, kind of the best couple hours of my day, Fantastic. aside from meeting my family at home at night. But uh, in fact, you can even see on, I have my own copy of the hymnal. Uh, not that you can see it on the radio, but uh, <laughs> you can tell exactly where I grab and, and which hymns I tend to gravitate to, because the pages are a little more worn. But, uh, you know, I, I have to say that it's actually been really, really wonderful. Um, yes. If if only all of us had our own hymnal at home, it's it's an investment. But when you really dig with these things, uh, and and these hymns are wonderful because they really are prayers too, uh, just like the Book of Psalms. When you don't necessarily have the right words, uh, you have wonderful prayers and words there given for you. And so much of our hymnody uh, really is is nothing more than God's word being set to song. So, so that that's my plug for picking up your own copy of the Lutheran Service Book and having it with you. Okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because That's it's right. really useful, and it's a wonderful tool. And, and, and I hope you'll join me in the afternoon music block, too. 1 to 3 p.m. <laughs> That's Central right, Central Time. time. <laughs> That's right. Fantastic. And today, as we look at Malachi, chapters, the end of chapter 3 and chapter 4, we actually get to do a little bit of a Christmas in July. Well, we'll not to spoil too much, but I know, right? <laughs> we have the opportunity to look at a Christmas hymn today. So before we get there, though, Pastor Gribben, I'll give us some context. What should we know about Malachi as we prepare to look at our section today? Well, Malachi is uh, it's, it's the last of the Old Testament books in, in, in our Bibles, and it really sort of sets the stage for, for the New Testament. And as, you, as you've been exploring this and reading this, and, and, and the listeners have been following along, you know, you're probably starting to see, especially starting with chapter 3, all of the sort of the imagery, the illusions, some of the parables of Christ are popping into your head as you're reading through this and saying, wow, wow, this is, this is exactly what he said he was going to say, and, and, and he does. And it, it really is a, a wonderful blending of, of all that takes place in, especially in the Gospels, uh, where our, our salvation is secured with the incarnation, the death, resurrection, ascension of Christ, and pulls into the very end of the New Testament as well. Uh, Revelation and Malachi, uh, sort of uh, bookends of the wonderful uh, work, story, life, and ministry of Christ and the apostles. And what's uh, remarkable about the end of Malachi is not only do you see these very clear prophecies of Jesus, but you actually also see clear prophecies of John the Baptist, who, you know, he's the one that shows up at the beginning of the Gospels along with Jesus, the forerunner of the Christ. So as this book does conclude the Old Testament in our English Bibles, 
when you turn the page into the New Testament and you meet very quickly both John the Baptist and Jesus, you're perfectly prepared by Malachi to meet those two figures, even though, chronologically speaking, we're, we have a gap of 400 to 450 years. As you just turn the page, you're ready, having read Malachi, uh, to get into the New Testament. Amen. And and, and really, it's uh, it, it reminds me of that saying, you know, do not count as slowness the Lord, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because for him, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. You know, he is, he is doing all things in his own time and in the right time. And he's not slow to do these things either, uh, though in our sense, it may take longer than we would like. So let's go ahead and take a look at our text, which is the last text in Malachi. And again, the last text in the Old Testament as we have it in our English Bibles. We pick up with Malachi 3, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. That day, the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. That is our text for today, Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, through chapter 4, verse 6. Pastor Gribbon, as our text begins, we hear about what those who feared the Lord did. They began to speak with one another, and the Lord paid attention and heard them leading to this book of remembrance. Take us into those first few verses of our text. Well, sure. You see, the leading up to this has been this constant uh, uh, accusation. You know, God says, why did you do these things? Well, when did we do this thing? Well, why have you despised my name? When did we despise your name? And as I was reading through chapter 3, getting into chapter 4, all I could think of was, you know, my two boys on on one of their naughty days, right? Why did you hit your brother? Why, why, did you, why would you say I hit my brother? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that is so the way that we act, especially with God sometimes, and and we try to we I, we we'll, we first go into the denial phase. I don't know. I didn't do that, God. I didn't do that. Well, okay, I, I did it, but there was a reason I did it, and therefore that makes it okay. You know, and this is the same kind of of self justification that that God has been presenting and and pushing before them, saying, here's the proof. I'm calling you to repentance. I'm calling you to life. But they would not. They would not. They would not. And so, you know, his judgment is coming. And that's really, you know, what we have to see here in in chapter 4. It is the great and terrible day of the Lord, which, of course, we know is also the shorthand for, for, you know, the last day, the day of judgment when Christ returns again, right, to judge all peoples, the living and the dead. But there's this remnant, that faithful remnant, and that's who is sitting here speaking with one another. And and it's really it's that, that mutual consolation of the brethren, of, of those who hold to God's word, who believe and trust in his promises. You know, it's, it's the first commandment life, to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And God is, has promised not to forget them. You know, he, he will bring them to remembrance. And whenever God remembers something, that is a, a key that he's taking action. It's not just that he says, oh, yeah, I know you. But by knowing you, by recognizing you, by seeing you, uh, that the gaze of God is what makes us alive, right? Mm. And so we have then that the Lord paid attention and he heard them. And a book of remembrance, right, the, of, of he shall hold them and they will live forever. Because throughout the Old Testament, this is sort of a phrase, 
this book of remembrance or this book of memorable deeds, you know, things that should be and will remain forever because they're, they're useful, they're laudable. Well, in this case, this is even more than a mere book of remembrance. In fact, the better comparison we have is in the last book of the New Testament, the book of life of the Lamb, because that's where it counts to have your name, right, written in that book of life. And they will be written uh, in this book of remembrance, this book written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. And, of course, we have to remember that fear in this context with God is not one of terror like, like me and spiders, but it is, it is the reverent recognition that this is the creator, the sustainer, uh, the redeemer of the universe. This is the great and high and mighty king uh, by whom you live and who you die and, and in whose, uh, whose walk is, is each day guided by him. And so that fear, and then to esteem his name, which is to hold it sacred, right? It's, it's really almost the first three commandments of this law of Moses that's referenced a little later, right? Our relationship with God. And then I love how he says, they shall be mine on the day when I take up my treasured possession. And of course, that really uh, brings me out to, um, to where we have uh, the, um, in First Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, when, when we, you know, believers in Christ, all those who believe on his name, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, his own possession, his treasured possession, and he will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him, as in one who is faith, faithful and who holds fast. And, and, and you know, it, really, you know, the, we see that fourth commandment there, right? Honor your father and your mother as that reflection of the great first commandment. You know, we see in our relationship with our families, with our parents, with our children, and, and even with our neighbors, is a reflection of our relationship with God. And, of course, that's what Christ comes to restore, that relationship that was broken in the fall. Uh, now at en enmity with God and at enmity with one another, in Christ, that relationship with, uh, with all creation, it is, it is this peace that is restored, and then peace, peace with God. I want to go back to that thought of fearing the Lord, because that, that phrase at the beginning of our text stood out to me, because in the previous text, we found out what happened to those who didn't fear the Lord. Those who don't fear the Lord in Malachi 3, verse 5, were those against whom the Lord drew near for, for judgment. And, I mean, also on that day, that was in view there. And after he, he said that, the Lord you know, challenged his people who weren't fearing him, especially in the way that they weren't bringing the tithes and offerings, he said, you know, put me to the test, bring the whole tithe, and, and see if, if you fail to have anything. You won't have any lack. And so what I, what I love about the way that this text starts is you do see that, although certainly there were many people in Malachi's day who didn't listen, some did. They did fear the Lord in that sense of, of faith toward him, recognizing that he's God, they're not, and all that entails— they feared the Lord, and they, they talked to each other about this and said, you know what? The Lord's word is right. Let's, let's listen. Let's believe. Let's act on it. And the Lord paid attention and heard. So I, I think, you know, again, in the context of, of what we've just been reading, you see the Lord making good on his promise where he says, go ahead, put me to the, to the test, do what my word gives you to do, and, and see if I don't just keep my end. And he does. He remembers them. He does this. And it's it's all grace. You know, it's it's not a matter of you do your part, God does his. But you you see that when we place our trust in the Lord, he he always proves himself faithful. He is never unreliable. And I think that that his his action of grace for these people shows that reality that was maybe left hanging a little bit in the previous text now is made very certain that the Lord always keeps his promises. And I love how in chapter 3, verse 6, for I, the Lord, yeah. do not change, right? When he says he's going to do something, he will do it. He, he is your, your father. He is your creator. And everything that he does 
is, is for your good, is for your benefit. Just as we know with our earthly fathers, when we are disciplined by them, we are being treated as sons. And so when our Father in heaven brings forth judgment, it is not for, for the destruction of the person. It's not because he's so angry he's going to smite you and wipe you out and be done with you. It is all driven towards your repentance, towards your redemption, uh, to return to him. You know, test him. Does he love you? Of course. He always loves you, uh, no matter how awful and wicked we are, right? Yeah. And he does, but, but the way in which he cares for us is not the way that our sin would have him treat us, mm -hmm. but it is the way that grace would call us back. Pastor Gribbenau, in connection with, again, what that first verse says about those who feared the Lord spoke with one another, you used the term, the mutual consolation of the brethren. Talk a little bit more about what that is and, and how it factors into this text. I often think of, um, and, and, and I wish I could be St. Paul and just say, it is written. You'll, you'll have to maybe Google it up, but I know it's there in Scripture, right? That, you know, all Scripture is God-breathed, right? It is useful for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. I mean, it is the Word that brings us life. And when God speaks to us, we speak back to him. We repeat or echo, or kata echo or catechize. And that's what we do with one another, right? We, we speak that word of God to one another, the word of God that is useful for reproof, right? What you're doing is wrong. Repent, come and return, uh, correction, and then training in righteousness, building one another up, right? Sharing our tears, sharing our fears, sharing our joys. I mean, it, it, it is the, the life together, Right? And the, the fancy Greek word that uh, you might remember from uh, the, the initiatives of the conference of the Lutheran Church from a year before or two was, you know, koinonia, this life together. And it's, and it's that mutual consolation, right, that we, we care for one another, we look out for one another, we speak with one another in the way that God speaks to us, right, in both law and gospel, uh, for the care of our souls, for the, for the nurturing of our faith, and just for the joy of to be in the family of God. Mm. I really appreciate the mention of, of that here, that, you know, they heard Malachi preaching, and they, they actually spoke to each other about it, that they, they took this to heart, not just as individual believers, but as a, a congregation, as a church of believers. As they a body heard of this Christ. Word. Yeah, yeah, and that's just a, a remarkable thing to, to see. And again, how the, how the Lord paid attention to this, that it is... It is good for us to hear the Word of God individually, to be sure, and, and, you know, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, yes, but there is this community aspect in which we hear the Word of God together, we speak about that Word with each other, and, and through that Word which we speak to each other, which we hear from each other, uh, the Lord is at work among us. And I, I mentioned, you can you can speak to this as well, Pastor Gribbenau, but I, I can't tell you how many times... I've been blessed by that very mutual conversation of the brethren in a in a Bible study where just that back and forth interaction of hearing and speaking the word of God with my fellow Christians has been a, a blessing that I I would not have experienced had I just been reading it on my own in my room in the morning. And that's partly what I love about the Bible studies on KFUO is where we, you know, we, when you get two perspectives, right? It is the same word. And but but things uh, pop out to us. Different connections are made because of the way in which we've experienced life, or the way in which we've we've dealt with scripture, or maybe even it's just what what you read in your morning devotional. But our walk of life, each of us is engaging the world in a different way. It's I think it's one of the reasons we have you know four gospels. Uh, they speak of the same Christ. They speak of the same grace. The same salvation. Uh, but each writer unique, right, as an instrument of the Holy Spirit, uh, just as you have different instruments in an orchestra. You know, each has a different tone, a timbre, a different emphasis, uh, but they speak the same thing. And, and there's the richness that comes in that speaking. It's not just me and my Bible, but it's, it's really the, the, the brethren also to help us find our own blind spots and maybe keep us from just hammering on our own hobby horses. Uh, so... It's another, now speaking to our brothers in the office of the ministry, it's another good reason to show up at your circuit meetings, at your winkles, so that you're not just the man alone marching on his own way, and you're missing out on some wonderful things in Scripture that maybe you wouldn't see, but your brother would see. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate what you said about we the blind spots that we have. Again, within the context of Malachi 3 and what Malachi has been preaching thus far, as they get together because they fear the Lord and they, they start to speak to one another, this isn't, I, I would not imagine, that it's a, a conversation. It's like, yay, Jesus sort of conversation. But this is like, hey, we've blown it, guys. We need to confess our sins. And it's a really, you know, I mean, a, as you said, calling out your blind spots, a conversation that's a, a calling to repentance, It's which is, to be sure, a difficult conversation, but a necessary one, and one that ends for the people's great blessing in this case. Amen. Yeah, I, I don't imagine that this this conversation together uh, was, gosh, you know, all those other people, they are just dirt and they're so bad. I, you know, I'm so glad I am not like that man over there, because we, yeah. we know in uh, in the New Testament how that uh, <laughs> How that works out, right? Yeah. No, we. It, it is to recognize that yes, we have sinned, uh, and I, a poor sinful being, uh, need the forgiveness of God, and it's found in His Messiah, the promised Messiah of old, who very quickly will be identified by the Elijah who is to come, right? John the Baptizer, pointing him out. This is the Lamb of God who is taking away the sin of the world. That's the Messiah. That's the Christ. Yeah, yeah. So then in, in response to this, again, the Lord pays attention, he hears, he writes this book of remembrance, which is a, a marvelous thing. I appreciate you making the connection to the book of life in Revelation. I think that's, that's exactly the way to go. Just to, to elaborate a little bit on that, the, the fact that God writes it down, this is a significant thing. When, some get, when something gets written down, that is a, a very momentous event. Uh, the Lord's not going to forget if he writes it down, the Lord's, I mean, he's not going to forget anyways. Well, yeah, but, there is but, that truth. <laughs> but that action of, of the Lord writing, I think, again, helps to cement this thought of the Lord's remembrance, which I think you also mentioned, and maybe you could say a little bit more, when the Lord remembers, it's not simply a calling something to mind, like, I remember when it rained two weeks ago, but rather the Lord's remembrance is an action on his part in which he does something for the person or the group of people that he remembers. Yeah, when, when, he, when he hears and he remembers, it leads to him taking salvific action. And uh, it happens over and over in, in the Old Testament. Uh, but, you know, especially, I, I think of, especially in the context of Christ, right, the new exodus, you know, to bring us out of that darkness into his marvelous light, you know, the the people cried out, the Lord heard them, he remembered them. And that leads then to all of his saving arm, his mighty saving arm in, in Egypt to bring them out and then to, to set them there and say, you are my people. And here is, uh, as the way that, that Moses talked about it, right? You know, the, I set before you life and death. And I, and I loved that in, in Malachi a little earlier, that, that covenant with Levi, that is with the faithful priests, with those who are to 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 stand with God and the people, right, to, to be the intercessors until the great high priest comes, that that was, that was a, a covenant of, of peace. And I'm trying to remember where that was in, in which chapter, but it was a covenant of peace and of life. And that is what he gave him, right? And that is what, you know, this, this covenant is still there with these who paid attention, who heard, or the, the ones who feared the Lord, the ones who spoke with one another, are holding fast to that covenant, and of course, that we'll hear that again in, in chapter four. Remember the law of my servant Moses, calling back to that covenant that is of life and of peace. And how is that life and peace achieved? But in the one who fulfills that covenant, who fulfills that law, and that is Christ in, in being born sinless, living a sinless life, being tempted in every way that we are tempted to fulfill the law, because not a, not a dot or a, a tittle will pass away, right, until the fullness of the law, it's been fulfilled, and Christ has done that. And so in the time between, right, the promise of the Messiah that is to be in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and the realization of the, of the Messiah who has come and is incarnate in Christ Jesus, we hold to that to that covenant, living within that, which looks to the promised Messiah. These are these are the ways in which God has expressed His fatherly divine love and goodness to you, uh, and and a way in which we are able to see, since our conscience has been corrupted in the fall, when we have trespassed the Lord, when we are called to repentance, and also then 
in our forgiveness, uh, living in that in that forgiven reality of how we are then to actually do good to the neighbor and serve the neighbor and to love God by by showing forth the love that He's given to us. That's really the the purpose of the law in its in its third use, right? In the divine use of the redeemed uh, man or woman, right? Who is a child of God. The covenant of life and peace was back in chapter 2, where the Lord was speaking to his priests. He was calling them out for their faithlessness, but was reminding them of what what it truly meant to be faithful as a priest. And it was through them that that covenant of life and peace, through the work that the priests were giving, that the Lord intended to give that life and peace. The the thing, uh, just one more thing to bring out in terms of this book of remembrance, especially calling it a book of remembrance. You know, when I think about the book of life, and the name being written in the Book of Life, I often connect that to, to Holy Baptism. And I think that's I think that's a fair connection to make, that there the Lord writes our name in the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, in the Book of Life. The fact Amen. that it's called Book of Remembrance here, though, I, once, I want to make a connection then, I think, to the Lord's Supper as well, when Jesus says, do this in, in my remembrance. remembrance. You yeah. know? So the remembrance, it's... not only that I have of Him, but especially the remembrance that He has of me to give me His body and His blood. And, and you know, I, I this is this is me just seeing this sort of recognition. It's this is why it's not just a memorial meal because this is the Lord's meal, right? It's the Lord's supper, and and He, who is God, who when He remembers things happen, right? You know, yeah. He speaks and the world is made in His mind. It, it, how much more power is His thought than ours? Do this in remembrance of me. It's His supper. It's a real, tangible, actual thing. Right, his his thoughts creating, and and so when he says do this and remember it to me, it's more than just, uh, oh yeah, this happened, wasn't that nice? As much as here is the remembrance, right? <laughs> here is how God has remembered us entirely, right? To send His own Son into the flesh, and to give us His flesh and His blood to eat and to drink, just as He promised. And it's a hard thing. It's a hard saying, which. I have to say, you know, many of the people who had followed Jesus when he said, you have to eat my blood or eat my body and, and, and or eat my flesh, drink my blood, they, they walked away and the disciples said, it's a hard thing. And even today, uh, Christian uh, denominations that say, oh, it couldn't possibly be, you know, the true body and most precious blood of Jesus because he's up in heaven. Well, it's a hard thing. But what he has told us is this is my body. This is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, and it's, and it's really it's his remembrance too. I think that's yep. that's a beautiful connection that I I don't think I've ever seen. Speaking of blind spots, right? Oh, that's okay. Sharper, uh, sharper iron, sharp sharpening the sharpen iron, sharpen each right. other. That's right. The mutual consolation of the brethren happening right here in front of us. What a gift of God, Pastor Gribbenau. We're going to keep going more on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're looking at Malachi three and four this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Who does Lutheran Church Extension Fund serve, you ask? It's simple. We serve Lutheran Church Missouri Synod ministries and church workers with loans and ministry services. And it's faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, investing with LCEF that makes it possible for LCEF to serve these ministries. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, August 2nd. We're studying Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 through chapter 4, verse 6. Our guest today is Pastor Doug Gribbenau. He is mission advocate for KFUO Radio in St. Louis, Missouri. Pastor Gribbenau, prior to the break, we've seen how those who fear the Lord, they repent in speaking with each other and hearing the Word of God and 
listening to it as they have gone through the mutual consolation of the brethren. The Lord has heard them. He has written them in his book of remembrance. They are his own treasured possession. He's going to spare them. And it is this action of the Lord that prepares them for the coming day of the Lord. Before we hear that that day is coming at the beginning of chapter 4, the Lord speaks about that day as a day in which the distinction between the righteous and and the wicked will be seen. So help us as we begin this conversation concerning this coming day of the Lord. Well, you know, it, it is the day of, of judgment. And and we hear in, in the epistles, um, and, and, in, and also in the book of Revelation, you know, the sheep and the goats. And and that's sort of that, that interaction, you know, the, that uh, uh, when, when the, the Lord, the Son of God, is sitting on his throne to judge the heaven and the earth, he will separate between the sheep and the goats, right? And, and of course, the, the sheep, he will say, enter into the place uh, that was prepared for you, you know, the, the kingdom of my father. And they say, when did we do all these things that you said? It's, well, whenever you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And they go. And then the goats, you know, <laughs> you have to go to the place that was prepared for the devil and his angels, not the place that God wanted you, wanted humanity to be. But you've chosen and elected to reject the forgiveness of, of God and and be judged according to your own works. Well, when did we when did we not do these things? When didn't we visit you in prison or clothe you or feed you? Yeah, well, when you didn't do it for the least of these, you didn't do it for me, right? And and uh, and you and so we have that uh, that distinction on that day. Each of us will have to give an account of himself to God, which is to say that, that we'll see there what this real distinction is. And that distinction is going to be according to God's righteousness. So every good work that we do uh, in you know, this side of glory, if it's a civic good work, you, know, you, can, you can be a, a, a rich man who gives away every, all of his wealth. You can feed every single you know, person who's hungry. You can clothe every naked person. You can do all of these things. But if you do it apart from Christ, no matter how good the work, it is a filthy rag. Because there's only one, uh, one currency in righteousness, and that's the blood of Jesus. Mm. And that's the distinction between the, the righteous and the wicked, a one who serves God and who does not serve him. Because only in Christ are our deeds righteous. And in fact, more than that, in Christ, every deed is righteous. Even if it's a matter of just cleaning up the house and and putting away the toys, fulfilling your vocation that God has called you to, and doing it as a Christian, it it is well-pleasing to God, no matter how small or how great it might be, because it is only in Christ that good works spring forth. And I think of that vine and the branches, and, and part of that is because we hear about the root and the branch later on in the terms of judgment. But Christ is the vine, we are the branches. Only by being grafted into him does that righteousness flow through us, which is his Holy Spirit. And that's, that's the judgment that will be between the righteous and the wicked, uh, not in the way that the world sees these things. And of course, that's why it says once more you will see the distinction. Because in, in our sinful fallen world, we have a very wicked tendency to say, People, the, the, the people with the most toys, right, the, the biggest incomes, the biggest houses, oh, they must be so blessed by God. God must love them so much to give them all of this stuff. Uh, and, and then on the other end, we say, oh, you know, that guy doesn't have anything. Yeah, God must not like him very much. But that's also been the way in which humanity has, has divided people for, forever, and that's why in the epistles we have, why do you make a distinction between the rich and the poor in your church? This is not wise. This is not good. You know, St. Paul tells us that. In, in the Old Testament, it used to be the, uh, you know, the, the people with the great wealth and power were seen as those who were blessed by God. And, and that your, the goodness of your earthly life was seen to be a reflection on the goodness of your eternal life. And God has to reset our, our metric again, reset that judgment. On this, on this day that is coming, right, when the judgment will come, you will once more see the distinction that I have spoken to you over and over and over again uh, in, in his laws and as he calls his people to repentance over and over and over again. That distinction is 
faith in God, in his promises, in his Messiah. And, and notice how in this, this lead up to this day that's coming, we see the Lord once again answering some of the objections that his people had had previously concerning. They think the Lord's not making this distinction. He says, you will in fact see this. So it's going to come on this day, that's where chapter 4 begins, and on the one hand, this day is described first as a burning day, like an oven. Things are going to be set on fire. Talk to us about that first aspect of the day. That's in verse 1. Sure, the day is coming burning like an oven when all the arrogant and the evildoers will be stubble. And, uh, and you know, I, I really, I think of John the, John the Baptizer, right, in, in uh, the Gospel of St. Matthew, I think it is, in, in Matthew chapter 3, you know, he's talking here, uh, he's out there in the wilderness, he's doing his baptism of repentance, and, uh, and, and in verse 7, he sees many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism. He said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, right, this day of judgment, you know. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones, uh, which was a, a derogatory term for Gentiles as well, uh, to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Right? And so, it, that, and, and that is the way that you would also clean house. So it's an allusion to you know, the physical reality of cleaning out your, you know, brushing out the threshing floor, taking the chaff, tossing it into the fire, disposing of it, get rid of it because the house is now cleaned. It is now put in order. And that's really what this sort of day of judgment is. Uh, that that uh, a time when the whole of, of creation will be set in order, uh, returned, and in fact actually moved beyond even that uh, initial order pre-fall. Because the, uh, the new heavens and the new earth uh, we'll, we'll make the Garden of Eden look like a, a ramshackle hut. <laughs> it's so much more glorious than even that. So the day is coming. It, it will bring this burning judgment for all of those who are wicked, those who do not serve the Lord, those who do not fear the Lord, to use other language that Malachi has used in the past. So that's the day on the one hand. On the other hand, when you get to verse 2, you see what the result of that day is for those who fear his name. And and just to read what Malachi has there in, in 4 verse 2, for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Before we talk about leaping calves, just that phrase may sound familiar, and here's where we get to do a little bit of Christmas in not quite July, it's August now, but... And I have to admit to, to the listeners, even though I host the afternoon music block, uh, you know, actually Pastor Apple was the one that pointed this out to me, because <laughs> as I was reading chapter 4, I was saying to myself, why is this son of righteousness healing in his in its wings? Why why does that sound so familiar? And I, I googled the snot out of it uh, to try to find <laughs> where in the rest of scripture this was, and I was coming up with a bat and a zero, and and then as we were preparing for the show today, uh, Pastor Apple dropped this on me, and I thought, that's it. <laughs> That's why I know this. So I, I don't want to steal your thunder, brother. I'll let you introduce it. <laughs> so this this phrase is perhaps more well known among Christians today because of the Christmas hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. In Lutheran service book, it's the third stanza that begins like this. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. So Charles Wesley took those phrases straight here from Malachi chapter 4. There's your Christmas in August. Uh, talk to us about what Malachi is saying here with that phrase. You know, th this this is looking to the re restoration of all things, right? And and I think of, you know, that, that there will be no need for a lamp, right? Uh, because God will be their light, right? God who is shining amidst them. He is the sun, the sun of righteousness. And we really could spell it S-O-N as well, right? Because this is the dawning of the light that pierces the darkness, right? That, and Christ is that light of the world, the sun of righteousness. And in his light, you know, sin and wickedness are exposed. They are then consumed, really, as as with a refiner's fire, right? Or being set ablaze, right? That that you will pass through to be purified, to be renewed. The healing that is in his wings is to is to draw out, to destroy, to put away all of the sin, all of the depravity, all of those temptations that have that have clung to us since we were born. 
and it's that wonderful restoration. You know, and I imagine if if we really understood the weight of sin, uh, we, you know, we would think of it as as the worst cancer ever. And can you uh, uh, sort of see that here with the calves leaping forth? Uh, think of the most sick, cancerous person that you could imagine, and and the Lord comes and He heals them immediately. Their body's entirely restored, right? <laughs> you can imagine having been feeling miserable and horrible and being stuck in a hospital bed for months on end. What else would you do but to leap forth? <laughs> this beautiful, joyous freedom, free of this sickness. And, and that's really what, what original sin is, is that deep-seated infection. And what an amazing day it will be when, when we are fully cured of that. I mean, we will, we will leap forth, not just in body, but in soul, uh, with like these calves, joyous freedom, free from that. But also the healing in his wings, too. I was, I was recalling Christ before he goes into Jerusalem, right, to purchase our redemption. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. it sounds a lot like the first three chapters of Malachi, right? Mm. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. It's like the full three chapters right there. But he still goes. He does it because the Lord does not change. And he will redeem. He will fulfill his promises, just as he said. Yeah, the the image of the wings there, Jesus picks up on it in the Gospels. It, it, you can find it in Psalm 91, perhaps more famously in the Old Testament, at least, where the Lord says that he will, he will cover you with his pinions. Under his wings you will find refuge. So a place of refuge, a place of healing, is to be under the, the wings of the Lord. The image of, of calves leaping from the stall is an image of joy and, and gladness. If you've, ever, if you've ever seen calves leaping out in the field, that's just a very playful image that's what this day is going to be like for those who fear the Lord. You know, I was even thinking if, if you've been following along with the daily prayers at the International Center, uh, we've been in responsive prayer quite, quite a bit in the, in the versicles from Psalm 63, verse 7. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. I mean, that, that brings that, the whole joyous calves and the, and the wings of healing all together. It's uh, beautiful. So then in verse 3, the, the people of God, again, those who fear his name, they actually also tread down the wicked, who will be as ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord. So uh, this again, this distinction that is not being seen by the people right now, in which perhaps it seems that the wicked prosper, on the last day it will be seen and realized in, in the sense that those who, are, who have feared the Lord, they will, uh, to say it maybe perhaps not too crassly, but they'll be on top and not on the bottom. Yeah, you know, and, and I have to say, it, it, um, it, it, I, I initially had written, you know, a reversal, right? Because when yeah. we think of the atonement, we think of the great reversal. But it's really more than that. It's, it, it's more of a writing, you know, <laughs> of yeah. setting correct and setting in the proper order, right? Um, and, and I was thinking back to, uh, back to Ezekiel. Uh, in chapter 34, you know, God's, God's talking to faithless priests again, right? Uh, and, and, and to the wealthy, to the, to the ones who, who the world sees as blessed, you know, is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of the pasture? To drink clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Uh, but now <laughs> it has been restored, right? Yeah. That, they, that the wicked now find themselves underfoot. And of course, Going back to you know the the winnowing fork is in his hand on that day of judgment, this chaff has gone into that uh, unquenchable fire. They've been set ablaze, right, and they are but ashes. Uh, and and they and and really, what is it that happens to ashes as you spread them in the dirt uh, and you walk upon them? It, it's as if they disappear. It really sort of is is the opposite of that book of remembrance. That that this shall be totally mm -hmm. forgotten. Yeah. Uh, and and never remembered again. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good connection, I think. And to be, you know, be under the feet, there's that promise in Romans 16 that the, the God of peace will soon crush the serpent under your feet, or or if you think through the, the letters that are at the beginning of the book of Revelation, they all have this note at the end, you know, to the one who conquers. Well, because we are in Christ who has conquered, we also receive that same victory, as it says here, on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. So this is a, a day of victory in the Lord for God's people. As the people prepare to receive that day then, the Lord, as, as again, Malachi comes to an end and, and our English Old Testament comes to an end, he's going to bring up two key figures from the Old Testament. First Moses, then mm-hmm. Elijah. Talk to us first about Moses. Well, I love how you bring you know, Moses and Elijah and and I mentioned earlier about the you know the, the Exodus, right? As Christ was on the mountaintop at his transfiguration, you know, he's preparing for his exodus, or the Greek word that's used for that, of that deliverance, the great deliverance of us out of sin and into righteousness, right? Out of the kingdom of the devil and into the kingdom of God. Well, who shows up there to discuss with Christ this exodus? Moses and Elijah, right? The full law of God, all the words and speakings of his prophets there with uh, with the grace of the gospel of God incarnate right there in Christ Jesus. So in the meantime, remember the law of, of my servant Moses, right? The statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. And Moses is the lawgiver. He is, he is the one who reveals the will of God uh, to his people. This is how you should conduct yourselves. Not because I say so, although in, in a sense, really, because moms and dads get to do that because of their office, right? <laughs> because I said so. But it's not just because I said so. It's because this is what is good for you. This is what is healthful for you. This is what keeps you safe. Uh, this is what will help you to be and live a happy and long life, right? So Christ is going to fulfill this law, right? The statutes and rules and commanded. Uh, but this law... It's so in patient faithfulness, we hold fast to this command. We are faithless sons. We look to our Father for his guidance, for his direction. Uh, it is that covenant of life and of peace. And of course, you know, back in chapter 2 also, it says, you know, the faithful ones also feared the Lord, right? They revered him. They, they knew who he is, uh, the, the author of life and author of death too, right? He's the one who kills and the one who makes alive. And so in our waiting, in this patient faithfulness, we hold fast to his word. We trust what he said. We trust in, in, in him doing his promises. And we trust that he will remember us uh, as we cry out to him in this patient waiting. So there's Moses, and then it ends with, the book of Malachi ends with Elijah. The Lord promises he will send Elijah the prophet before that great and awesome day of the Lord comes. We've got about six minutes on the morning here, Pastor Gribben. So let's make sure we talk about Elijah, and then maybe leave a little bit of time, just kind of wrap things up and, and think about how we transition from here into the New Testament. Yeah, and and so this, I love that this is this, this is the connection. And, and I remember one of those... Uh, one of those little pieces of trivia that you pick up in seminary that, you know, your first year because you're a neophyte like I was, right, and and you don't have a great command of Scripture, that they drop this little hint, well, who who is the last prophet in the Old Testament? And it's the only name you wouldn't think to but say, because the last prophet of the Old Testament is John the Baptist, right? He is then the one who was promised right here at the very end of Malachi, I will send you Elijah, the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And and, and then even in the Gospel of St. Matthew, right, just turn right through to chapter 11, right? Um, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 13, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, John the Baptist. And if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come, he who has ears. Let him hear. That is our Lord speaking there and saying, this is the Elijah that God has promised to send you when he stopped speaking, right? And that's, and that's what happens. The end of Malachi, that's it. And God is silent until his son. 
uh, well, and really in, until uh, until we get the the first words there of, of Matthew. But uh, but you know the prophet is being prepared, right? John in his mother's womb with his with his dad, who can't say a word until he says his name is John, right? <laughs> and of course Mary visiting Elizabeth. You know, God, you've got the Elijah who is to come, and the Christ who is in the womb of his mother, right? And 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 the first person to recognize and rejoice like a calf leaping is John in his mother's womb, right? Yeah. He is that Elijah before that great and awesome day of the Lord. And and really, I think we have to to maybe expand a little bit beyond what we think of because we, we talk about the, the great and terrible day, right? The great and awesome day of the Lord. And we tend to think of that as only his second coming, the day of judgment. But really, we have to widen that scope to say the entirety from incarnation to So for that first advent of waiting for Christ to be born, the Messiah to come to his second advent, is really part of this whole day of the Lord, and it is great and awesome. It includes the incarnation, the atonement, and that day of judgment, right? And and so Elijah comes, he ushers that in, as as John the Baptist does. You know, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, And he's baptized in the River Jordan, and... The Lord sends the the dove, and and the Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And he begins the work, right? The Holy Spirit casts him out into the wilderness for the temptation to to go through all of the things that we have suffered, um, the temptations of sin, and to endure all these things, and where we have failed for him to be the conqueror, right? To fulfill that law of Moses, his servant. And, uh, and that's part of that great and awesome day. That's part of what makes it so great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So these words from Malachi 4, the, the angel Gabriel quotes them in announcing Zechariah's birth, or excuse me, John's birth to Zechariah. So mm-hmm. we see, again, how this just seamlessly transitions us into the New Testament. And maybe to, to help us wrap things up, because we've got about three minutes here, Pastor Gribbon, on, just to think again about this great and awesome day of the Lord, which, you know, Judgment Day, the end, and yet... That end comes ahead of time to our Savior Jesus Christ. It comes to him. He receives the judgment in our place so that you know, we can use these words from Malachi 4, not so much in an end times hymn, but in a Christmas hymn. That, That's right. That here is the way judgment is brought. It comes first to Jesus so that for those who are in him, we receive, again, this great joy of the calves leaping, the sun of righteousness, the healing, the, the treasured possession, the remembrance forever. Uh, just help us to wrap things up. Two minutes, Pastor Gribbenau. Sure. I, I've often visualized in my own mind that, that, that the, the, the death and resurrection, the atonement right, of Christ Jesus is the, is the great pin, the linchpin upon which all of creation rotates, because... Really, the, the end of all things, right, that, that great and terrible day of the Lord, when the new heavens and the earth, new earth will come, it's an end of this old, but it's a beginning of the eternal new and the glories. And, of course, Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. So before he even spoke, let there be light, this was, this was the reality upon which everything hinges. And, and so that's the central point of all things, and it's all drawn into that into the atonement, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And, and that's what John the Baptist uh, is, is sort of going to be bringing forth, right, to, to have that baptism of repentance, turning the hearts of fathers to the children, the hearts of children to their fathers. Throughout Malachi, we've, we've seen about that, that abusive relationship of, of how they're supposed to be doing these things, they don't do these things. And the family of God really is to see that there, of God the Father and his children. And and so we see John the Baptist right now taking us from our sin, which is us curled in on ourselves, and then outward again. And what more than a father who cares for his children, a mother that cares for her children, and the hearts of the children, the sons and daughters, turning to their mothers, turning to their fathers, a right relationship. And that is then what John is, is to prepare the way for so that Christ brings that full restoration of the hearts of the children finally being returned back to their Father in heaven, and our hearts then being turned out to one another, of children to our earthly fathers and our earthly family as well. And that's and, and it's and it really is to say this is this is the wonderful thing that is to be, that is to come. I've promised to do it, it shall be. I will send you Elijah 
this will happen, but also take heed and hear, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction, lest, lest your name not be found in the book of life, in the book of remembrance, but be forever forgotten uh, and cast away into the place prepared for the devil and his angels, where the Lord's gaze never looks. Yeah. So repent, believe the gospel, <laughs> look right. for the coming Savior. When you hear the, the preaching of the forerunner, look for the Savior. He has come. His name is Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the one to whom Malachi points. That's the one we've been hearing about today from Pastor Doug Gribbenau, Mission Advocate at KFUL Radio in St. Louis, Missouri. He's been helping us today to study Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 through chapter 4, verse 6. Pastor Gribbenau, thanks for being our guest today. Hey, thanks for letting me uh, bookend the Old Testament. It was fun. God be praised. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about the end of Malachi, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Join us next week as we begin a new book here on Sharper Iron. We're going to take a look at Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk to you again next week. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.